Hey guys, welcome back to Medieval History. It's Mr. Bostick here. Um, it's time for us to take a closer look at chapters 12 and 13, uh, France versus England, let's call it. And it makes a lot of sense in some ways to, to look at them together because as we've seen in the readings and the terms, the, the French, at least after, I'm sorry, the English, at least after the Battle of Hastings with William the Conqueror, Duke of Normandy, now being King of England, they're so interlaced, the, the English and the French, that it's hard to really understand what's going on in one country without taking into account the other. So let's go ahead and jump on in. And just as a, a heads up, <clears throat> there's a lot here, clearly. There, um, there, there'll be a lot of maps. And, you know, in some of our slides, there are going to be a number of points. So maybe the finer points that, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to kind of skip over detailing a lot out loud. <clears throat> but please feel free to pause the video and take a look. You really should make sure you go through and at least read through the notes that are there. They may be stuff that's familiar from the text or from your notes themselves, the term notes you took. But just as a review, it's a good idea. And that some of the stuff has been added. It's not in the text. So make sure you're reading it. Even if I didn't say it out loud, it's a good thing to you know go ahead and include all that in the visual side and the auditory side for, the, for our review. All right, let's go ahead. All right, now... <clears throat> One way of looking at this is essentially that once you have Norman rule in England, and that is after the Battle of Hastings, after William the Conqueror has enforced his will um, very heavy handedly, you know, Domesday Book and all, right, uh, counting every last pig and sheep belonging to every last hamlet in England, um, you have, and, and for that matter, imposing all of his Norman French nobles that supported him as the nobles throughout England, displacing the former nobility, you have essentially French rule in England, although it's not the king of France, right? And what that means is that at this point, England, English politics and French politics are really a big family feud of the French family. Now, it's not it, this, it, so far, the Dukes of Normandy, William, William the Conqueror in particular, is not a descendant of the royal family. Remember, he descends from kind of recent Viking stock, right? But being, becoming king of England means that those families actually will become interlaced pretty quickly, right? And here we have a king of England who is also still Duke of Normandy. And the, the kings of France are surrounded by a lot of different powerful, large land-holding nobles, dukes, who very often can and do resist their royal power. And so one of them now is not only that Duke of Normandy, but he's also the king of England. I mean, you can see where the rivalry is going to come from here, right? If you take a look at the map of France in the medieval period, you see within this star, you know, the royal domain, this dark green section, is really quite small. This is what's called the Ile de, de France, and meaning the island. And you can see why the, the kings felt sort of imprisoned in this little island, surrounded by more powerful dukes in many cases, especially down here with the Duchy of Aquitaine. Look how much larger that is, right? And so what that means is, by the time you have a few descendants down the chain from William the Conqueror in England, who marries Eleanor of Aquitaine, right, who previously, by the way, had been married to the King of France before, uh, before that was dissolved, right, you have a, that Duke of Normandy, now King of England and Duke of Normandy, also ruling Anjou, and but through marriage, ruling Aquitaine, taking over Brittany, which is this section, and Toulouse down here, you have the King of England ruling more of France as a nobleman, mind you, than the King of France himself directly rules. And so a strong rivalry as compared to modern France that's known, has been known for centuries for being very, very centralized every, you know, in, in terms of its mentality, in terms of the, the, the language spoken by Frenchmen, you know, much, much more centralized, much, much more you know, centered on Paris and rule coming from Paris. <clears throat> and what unifies them, as proud as they may be of their regional identity, having a much stronger sense of what it means to be a Frenchman, right? Instead of just the regional identities of, you know, Brittany, Normandy, Bordeaux, Toulouse down here, right? The, the uh, Burgundy over here on the east, right? You have a very different sense. Right, in the modern period. And a lot of that's created by the reaction of the medieval French kings to their weakened position. Right. And this is essentially the Capetian dynasty. Right. Now, what do they have to do? Well, the first thing is, unlike the Holy Roman Empire, 
secure, if you could pay managers to do this, as you could do, you couldn't do a lot more than this. But you know, the the passing on of a crown from father to son, in a continued path. In fact, for more over three hundred years, right? So it, this is this is something that is a shift of pattern. It's something that hadn't been seen as reliably before. And the nobles who were used to, in fact, did elect Hugh Capet king, when that power is taken away from them, or it pulled away from them by having the, the more the increasing expectation that the next king will be the king's son, <clears throat> then at this point, that's weakening the nobility and therefore strengthening the, 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 the hands of the king. All right? Now, that first focus that, that these Capetian monarchs tried to implement was keeping the business at home, right? In that Ile de France, specifically the cities of Paris and Orléans, right, really trying to, you know, reinforce their effective rule, their their effective, you know, control over their own regions, and, you know, administering them well, administering justice well, you know, maintaining the loyalty of the people, right? They also tried, you know, and succeeded in getting rid of some of the hereditary officers, meaning nobles who had the official kind of hereditary additional task of X, Y, or Z office kind of lumped in with his title, getting rid of them, since for them, having additional offices was a way to have extra power that could be used against a king, you know, and instead using hired servants, hired high appointees who had loyalty really just only to the king, and if they didn't do a good job, they could be fired, right? This is a more, uh, it's, a, it's a way of strengthening the hand of the monarch. Right, so to slowly overcoming the might of these regional dukes throughout France. All right, also instituting royal justice. In other words, not just leaving everything to nobles. Right, as we've seen time and time again, alliance with the church, adding to the authority of the kind of the era, the the aura of sanctity of the the royal anointed king. And here, the particular ally is the Abbe Suger, right, in at Saint Denis, and this is not very far outside of Paris. Uh, who is both the ally and essentially becomes the prime minister of the French king, although it wasn't the official title. Um, he, by the way, also is one of the first creators of the Gothic right, at Saint-Denis. And, you know, and moving out from there, this kind of new theory of architecture. Right? The, the, these Capetian kings encouraged towns. We've already seen that with the, the trade fairs around in the Champagne region just outside Paris. Right? Encouraging towns by issuing royal charters and therefore creating taxable revenue for all of the, the merchant activity, which is, of course, going on through those towns, right? And, in fact, taking advantage of the fact that townsmen are often, like we saw with churchmen above, more loyal ministers, partly because, <clears throat> especially in the case of townsmen, they don't really have their own power base. The only power they have is that which is given to them by the king. And so they, don't, they can't really be a rival. They can only be a more loyal servant, or at least they're more likely to be than many dukes or counts might be, right? Um, the Capetians also accept money instead of feudal services because that increases the cash flow and their ability to exercise better direct control. Remember, most of the, a lot of economy in, in, in everywhere, France included at this point, is barter economy, not so much buying and selling with cash, right? And they certainly don't have anything, you know, more like high tech than cash, right? But tech, cash itself was pretty rare. And the kings would typically find themselves at a loss and a need of revenue, a need of money, right? And so they, they, you know, these Capetians learn how to better enforce their dues, better collect their revenue, and better to kind of monetize that instead of having services as, as promised through the feudal contract. You know, increasing, increasingly building up France into the most centralized power in all of Europe, certainly more than the Holy Roman Empire, right? And Creating at the same time this firing of feudalism, towns, commerce, you know, universities, the Gothic, all these these kind of hallmarks of the medieval, things that really kind of centralize and solidify first in the French model. All right now, in terms of the powerful powerful Capetian kings, we have you know Philip Augustus, Philip II, who you know was a rough contemporary of Barbarossa, and as well as in England, and really the primary rivalry with England, Henry II as well as his two sons, Richard the Lionhearted and Bad King John, right? who, of course, there at the same time as being English kings, they're also French nobles. And this is kind of strange conflict of being a rival and also being a feudal, you know, have, you know having your rival be your feudal lord. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a bizarre kind of family feud type conflict as we've seen. 
right? And yet Philip Augustus manages to do that process well, even when he has bad King John trying to, you know, to team up with the Holy Roman Emperor against him, things fall apart. Notice the, the cast of characters here on the English side, this is all Robin Hood time, right? This is, these are all the, the main, some of the main characters of Robin Hood. You know, good King Richard the, 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 that's away on crusade, and bad King John who's ruling, uh, who's seizing power in his place, right? Right. Now the following king, St. Louis, or Saint, you know, Saint Louis, King Louis IX, this by the same you know the, the same Saint Louis that our city of Missouri is, is named after, right? It was very internationally famous for his justice, right? Even it is the book mentions justice to the Saracens who captured him on crusade. So you know he's he's get this glowing kind of reputation for holiness and justice, and you know for administering it down to the particulars and holding court and issuing you know sort of like the justice of Solomon and. You know, he gained a, a very, very strong reputation, which really bolstered the, the respect and the sense of connection that the French had with their monarchy. And he was a pious, you know, he was a saint, right? He's a pious and, and a model ruler and very generous to the church. But the irony is, as pointed out in our text, that by being such a good king, he encouraged a lot more trust in the monarchy and therefore ends up weakening the church. Right? At least indirectly, because his, his heir, Philip IV, or Philip the Fair, and by the way, that doesn't mean good or just, that means like, good looking, or, you know, like a fair maiden, except, you know, he's not a maiden, right? <clears throat> he realizes at this point, okay, the, the, the dukes, the nobility is more or less placed, put in his place. The only la rival standing to the royal power is the church, right? And so this group that the Capetians needed as ally to begin with become the rival. Just like we saw in the Holy Roman Empire, right? And he ends up calling the Estates General together. This is roughly the equivalent of the British Parliament, or what we would call Congress later on in history, right? And every, uh, you know, in Spain it was the Cortes. Every place had this that the kind of medieval sense that things that touch the principle is things that touch all should be approved by all, right? And typically, rulers would call these these great gatherings of the major aspects of their civilization, the major you know, worthies from throughout their civilization, their their country, when they needed money, right? And so he calls this first estates general and gathers money and uses it to go and seize the Pope. Now, he quickly turned him back over, but the, the Pope died shortly thereafter, and he's able to strong arm his way into having a, a small select group of cardinals, many of them Frenchmen, elect a Frenchman as Pope and begin orchestrating the Babylonian captivity of the Pope moving the whole papal court to Avignon. Now, it, by the name, you'd guess that's in France, but remember our map. It's not actually France. It's just very close to neighboring France, basically in, in Burgundy, right? Today it's in France, but at the time it was just sort of in the French back pocket, so to speak. Papal lands, granted, but yeah, everyone knew what that really meant. And this seems to be the ultimate triumph of king, over church, you know, this this whole struggle we constantly see between the power of the state and the power of the church. You know who's going to rule out whose power is supreme. Right by the end of his reign, you know, the Louvre power. Pardon me. The the Louvre, which is now a museum, but at the time was the primary palace of the French monarchs um, in Paris. You know Paris itself as the capital city, originally a fortress, but at this point the main capital city of the kings. You know. The Parisian French, for that matter, we don't think about this, but the different regions of, of France spoke different variations of French, and it becomes Parisian French that becomes much more the dominant language of the Chanson de Geste and the whole literature, the medieval literature of, of, of chivalry. And all these things, French become not only the, you know, the hallmark of France and the, the heart of kind of national identity, but have a huge effects. All, all throughout Christendom, as, as we've already made note of, right? Now, looking at the English side, right? Norman England, as we pointed out, you know, you have the Kingdom of England, yes, but they're also Dukes of Normandy, right? The, the Angevin dynasty is named after Anjou, right? As long as they possessed Anjou. This is a little confusing, and you should, you should have seen it in the terms. You know, it's the Plantagenet family called the the Angevin dynasty, while they still hold Anjou, and later simply called Plantagenet, right? 
down until much later in, in the in the sort of late medieval period in English the English monarchy. Right. A few, in, you know, not very far into it, you know, we have Eleanor of Aquitaine, as mentioned a second ago, who had earlier been married to a French king, now being married to Henry II of England. And so the whole territory of Aquitaine comes into the same kind of family grouping, as well as Brittany, this section over here, and Toulouse, this whole major swath down south of England, and, you know, where you have the same ruler, king of England, as noble and different guises here be a major rival against the, the, the king right, the, in, in France, right? So, the, you know, what's going on, all right? So after 1066, after the Battle of Hastings, as we said, the English kings and the nobles really are just our Frenchmen, right, for a good while. And they think like that and they act like that, right? Besides being, as we said, Dukes of Normandy, this, you know, Angevin dynasty from Anjou, they speak French for centuries. They spent more time in France and on crusade than at home many, in many cases. They're mostly buried in France, including the good King Richard of Robin Hood fame, right? They are, perhaps you weren't aware of that, right? They control more France than the French king. You have, you know, and you have a lot of, in fact, for that matter, family infighting among themselves over power, right? Um, especially in this family, this power broking fa brokery family of, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry II, you know, Duke of Normandy, and et cetera, et cetera, plus King of England, and his two powerful kings, who, sons who succeed him, right, uh, Richard the Lionhearted and Bad King John. Right? <clears throat> now, interestingly and ironically, it's by losing the French lands, or almost all of them, the Bad King John, in certain ways, makes the English monarchy a little more English. And through, when he has the Magna Carta forced on him by his barons, indirectly helps to create some of the most one of the most distinctive features of English identity in, in its jurisprudence in this this principle that even the king is answerable to the law. And now variations on that existed elsewhere, um, even in France, that you know the king is limited by tradition, but very few other places had a quite as emphatic an insistence on that as develops in England, especially after the Magna Carta. Um, some historians it will, some historians point out, and that's I think rightly so, that peop, that we tend to read back onto the Magna Carta way more than was meant by it at the time. But without getting into all the details about that, you know, historians have for centuries looked back to that document and really seen that as kind of the first birthplace of the, the English tradition of liberties in law. And that's certainly something, the tradition that comes out of England in a way that it doesn't come out of really any other part, even of the West, and has spread itself all around the world, especially here, right? So, it, it's, so it, it's worth keeping that in mind. So we have, you know, England, yes, but England, yeah, as we see down here, which is almost half French in, it, in its possessions. Okay. <clears throat> Notice the Florida lead. Now, this is something not really pointed out by the text, but I, I think it's good for you to know this, right? From 1340, King Edward III, right? And this is not that long after Philip the Fair, for that matter. You know, the Capetian line had died out. It, had, it didn't have a male heir. Right? And Edward III, who was the nephew of the, of the previous and the last Capetian monarch, claimed the throne through his mother, who was Capetian. Right? But the French had a tradition of not allowing inheritance through a female line. And this begins... What is, what's eventually called the Hundred Years' War. This is where we get, you know, Henry V of Shakespeare's fame. You know, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. You know, coming from the scene at the Battle of Agincourt, where he trounce the French. Right, he, he briefly conquers. He, you know, he intermarries with the royal family. His son actually is, is the only monarch that not only claims to be king of England and France, but in fact acts actually is effectively both king of England and king of France, and you know. That's the only one who effectively is. But that claim is made, and you see it in the heraldry, and you see it in the, you know, the stylized listing of the, the, the territories and the claims of, of English kings all the way down until 1801. Right? After the French Revolution, when the French Republic doesn't have a king anymore, I mean, that things will shift around later. It, it, but, you know, there aren't, aren't any kings in France anymore. <clears throat> and 
This is after an American Revolution, in fact, right? So that that claim is a long-standing one, and <clears throat> excuse me, and and you you see it all the time in art. The, these three the lions are brought into the heraldry of England by Richard the Lionheart, and then the French claim, the claim to the French throne here in the Florida de Lis, is repeated again and again in in the heraldry and the, in the claims of the English monarchy, uh, symbolizing their territories. So and we see it, you know. Here and there, you know, from Edward the Third, thirteen forty, to George the Third in eighteen o one, at which time the, that it, that claim is dropped and hasn't been used since, right? So it's a, but it's nonetheless a pretty long family feud here, right? Now Henry the Second is in many ways one of the most dynamic of these Plantagenet or, or Angevin kings, right? Um, what's his legacy, right? Well, one, the common law, and this is a really important thing. I mean, we we don't talk as much about it in American history, but American Jurisprudence is based on common law as well. If you look at, you know, constitutional law and looking at precedents of how the Constitution is interpreted as opposed to just the legal statutes, that's exactly what common law is really about, right? Now, for Henry, the, the king's justice, right, insisting that, you know, both tri official accusations for a crime and trials be managed by grand juries and petty juries, and this is overseen by the king's, you know, sheriffs or the shire reeves, right? This whole process is essentially taking a whole, kind of making more uniform a process of justice, taking it out of the hands of local magistrates and local nobles, and, you know, having it the king's justice and the ability to appeal to the king or you know, appeal to the king's court and being and judges themselves being answerable to the traditions of common law, right, and really kind of solidifying that is something that, that becomes a great legacy of England, even if it's something that Henry didn't realize was creating um, so much a legacy. Right. Now, his son, you know, influences as well, right? The, you know, both legendary King, you know, King Richard the Lionheart, and then bad King John, as we mentioned before, who ironically through Magna Carta being forced on him at Runnymede in 1215, right, has in fact indirectly assisted in that kind of creating a basis of liberty in English law, right? What's another legacy? Power struggle. One, it's in his family. Warfare between himself, his wife, you know, scheming you know, against one son, against the other son, you know, fighting wars and struggles in England, wars in France, crusades. There, there, there's a there's a power brokering family that, that in an international level, right, quite literally, right, and also <coughs> famously trying to control the church here, as we you know, wonder of wonders, we've seen that with all the monarchies, right, but. Taking, you know, making an attempt by getting a friend of his, Thomas of Becket, uh, and appointing him Archbishop of Canterbury, only to find out that, that Thomas made a pretty good Archbishop and wasn't just a, a yes man, a, a weak, you know, kind of puppet figure. And, you know, the same kind of investiture issue where the king looks at archbishops as high vassals and wants them to act like vassals and wants the church to be a way of, you know, exercising extra type of control and you know, and, and sanctifying themselves at the same time, right, it backfires on him because he gets so frustrated with Thomas that after, you know, a long series of conflicts, you know, he, you know it, people debate whether he really meant for this to happen or not, but his soldiers go and and slash down Thomas in his own cathedral. And immediately, people, you know, pe people start calling him a saint, miracles start being attributed to him, and the king ha has to publicly prostrate himself. I mean, this, this whole effort at kind of exerting royal authority over the church backfires. So the church in England is actually quite independent after Becket's martyrdom until Henry VIII, who declares himself the head of the church completely and breaks away from Rome entirely. I mean, this is far more than any of these medieval kings were trying to do, right? And of course, that's a different time period. That's, that's in the early modern period. And very much, you know, the, the you know after the medieval, but just after. And but it, it, it's something that that people tend to forget if they only look at English, the history of the Church in England, post Reformation, how how closely it was tied to Rome, and how how much more so even in England than than anywhere else, the Church actually did manage to exert, you know, its own independence and authority. All right. Now another key thing: the English Parliament. Now, the first one, of course, being called by Simon de Montfort, and this is after, you know, the the, the stronger, you know, that, well, 
after Bad King John's son, Henry III, who it was a much more pious, in many ways, king, but more or less effective, and that's why he's called weak in the text, right? Um, there, there was a strong reaction from a lot of high nobles to seize power, to insist that he give them power um, in, in over many, you know, aspects, and he didn't resist them in, in, in the end. But some of the lower nobles and other people didn't, you know, didn't want to see the, the high nobles walking away with everything. And so Simon de Montfort, who's these days more famous for, for other writings, right, um, called for this gathering of worthies throughout England and what's considered to be the first parliament. But later, with with the, not the son, but the grandson of Bad King John, and this is Edward I, better known perhaps to his Longshanks from Braveheart, if you've seen that movie, right, he was a very energetic, strong, powerful, ruthless king. Right? It fought wars in France and conquered Scotland and conquered Wales very effectively. You know, a, a power hungry uh, and and very effective ruler. But wars are expensive, and at one point, he in needing money, he calls uh, together a, a, a parliament, and this has come from the French word, you know, parlar. To uh, my French is horrible. Forgive me. But the word means to speak, to talk, right? And really probably seeing this as just sort of a gathering for him to announce to and discuss things with worthies throughout the state. But, you know, he gathers up, you know, the bishops and the barons, the knights, a few knights and a few townsmen from each region, right? But they refuse to grant the king money until he will acknowledge that he can't raise taxes without their approval. And this is what comes to be known as the power of the purse, the power of money, right? Essentially, the power to control the flow of revenue to the king. You know, basically, the kind of the idea that the king can't force people to pay money unless they consent, and by consent they mean unless the parliamentarians are willing to agree to it, right? So this is it's it's you know of course building up their own power, but at the same time it's it's forcing the king once again like in Magna Carta. To acknowledge limits, and this is not a king who liked to acknowledge limits. I mean, in the end, he got his money, but this principle had been established, right? So we have in the English Parliament. Notice the spelling; it's Parliament, right? Parliament. It's not the Parlement, the French version, which is a Supreme Court, right? Keep that in mind, right? So the what you have here is something similar to the Estates General, as called every once in a while and, and used in France. Or as we said, the Cortes in Spain. I mean, almost all, you know, essentially all European countries had something similar. But this, the, the, it became the basis in England of essentially trying to underline bit by bit, more and more as time went on. You know, it would become the system of underlining the, the power of the people as opposed to the monarch. For a while later on, the getting rid of the monarch altogether and then bringing it back. But it, of course, they still have a monarch to this day. But the point being that, that all this, this sense of modern appeals to representative democracy, including our own, are all really rooted here in the British Parliament. And that starts here with this model parliament, which is in 1295 and is called the model because it serves as the pattern right, for what directly happens in England and what is picked up and built off of in other places. All right. So with English civilization, you know, eventually... These Norman and French, you know, imposed rulers and the Anglo-Saxons of England, even in the, la the level of language, things fuse, right? The cultures merge into something that be much, much more that we would be able to, to recognize and, and identify with today, right? The English Gothic also develops. Remember, this is really like, you know, the French cousins a little further out, right? But in a distinctive way, with the, the Nor Norman or Romanesque features, right? Particularly here, Westminster Abbey, which is what we see here. And that's a church, a lot of people tend to think of it as a cathedral. It's not. Um, London's cathedral is the Cathedral of St. Paul's. This is, anything called Minster has to do with a monastery, right? But this one has always been connected to the English monarchy, right? And so it's been the great house, uh, the great church of the monarchy. And it's the place of every coronation that's happened since 1066. In fact, even before William the Conqueror, the previous, the very last Anglo-Saxon king to be crowned was crowned here in 1066. You know, the same one that turned Harold and went around, went out and immediately got killed by William the Conqueror. Right? You know, the development of you know universities at Oxford and Cambridge, the ends of court, since basically lawyers' guilds that were founded 
near the king's court, right, um, to teach and to exercise the practice of the common law. Um, in fact, as the book mentions, using temp buildings that had, had to be vacated by the disbanded Templars, Knights Templar, right? The, um, the creation and the, the reinforcement of a very distinctive and famous common law tradition that in many ways is much more stable than, than the idea of justice always coming straight from a magistrate, and which creates more kind of a whimsy of power, right? And London, which by far was the biggest city of any of the cities of England, but by our standards, you know, it looks pretty tiny. It only had about 40,000 inhabitants at that time. And I haven't looked, but I'm sure that Wheaton probably has more than that, right? So, you know, our senses of what a city is have shifted quite a lot throughout history. Um, and, you know, look at many of the pillars of civilization that were built by, town, by cities that we think of as the size of a small town, right? Um, so, and to wrap up, the Westminster Abbey, I think it's it's worth bringing this in, that not all of it was, you know, came in with the, the text, right? The Westminster Abbey, Abbey was, as I said, always a royal church. It's the shrine where the last Anglo-Saxon, acknowledged Anglo-Saxon king, Edward the Confessor, was buried. This is, this is you know, a saint. He is the, the last uh, the fully acknowledged Anglo-Saxon king. It's from him that William the Conqueror claimed le to legitimately inherit rule. Right, and he had had built the original abbey, right? Um, and as as I mentioned a second ago, every king since 1066, even before William the Conqueror, has been you know received their coronation there, right? Now, Edward the First, remember this is the grandson, the powerful grandson Longshanks, right? Grandson of King John, the bad King John, right? In his conquest of Scotland, he is depicted in Braveheart. He stole this very symbi symbolic thing. It's called the Stone of Destiny. And on this stone, and it, it, purported by the Scottish to be the stone on which Jacob rested his head when he had it, uh, uh, the vision in the Bible, right? Um, the the long-standing tradition in Scotland was that to be crowned king of Scotland, you had to be seated on this stone. And so Edward stole it and brought it down to London and built this coronation chair, this exact coronation chair, and placed it in Westminster Abbey that had been rebuilt by his father, right? And every king of England has been crowned on it since. Right? And you see down here, Elizabeth II, current queen of England, when she was being crowned in the 1950s, seated on that chair, right? With this, you know, the royal regalia being used. Now, you know, through all the ups and downs of history, you know, that, that, that established medieval tradition of identity of the kingship and even the kind of, you know, that, one-upmanship against Scotland by stealing the Stone of Destiny, right, has, has been maintained until 1996 when Elizabeth returned the stones to Scotland. Now, briefly in the 50s, it had actually been stolen and then, then surreptitiously returned quickly. But, you know, it was, it was an act of kind of defiance towards the idea of Scottish independence that didn't follow through. Uh, recently, there was a vote that re really close, but didn't quite follow through, right? Now, she, of course, is Queen of England, but she's also Queen of Scotland, and by inheritance, right? But uh, she has returned the stone to Scotland with and placed it with the Scottish royal regalia, but as her own, right? So it's been returned to to sort of acknowledge that distinction of of the different Scottish identity. Okay, so so guys, here we are. Um, this is the you know a quick review. I'm sorry, not as quick as I was hoping for, but you know two chapters worth of review for both the kind of medieval character of the French and the medieval character of the English and how much they're interrelated, but how much by the end, there's really quite a distinction that starts to be made um, in terms of the political identity and the national identity and a separate culture being developed as the Normans meld, meld you know, the Norman French meld into the Anglo-Saxon basic culture and language of, the, of England. And as the French develop their own separated path, you know, butting heads of the kings of England, you, you know, who eventually lose their French lands. You have this kind of differentiation into what we would recognize today, whereas at the beginning, it's more of a family view. All right. So, guys, uh, that wraps up our discussion of our chapters for the year. Uh, we, will, we will talk soon about how things are moving towards finals. I hope you're all doing well and uh, feeling prepared and not too stressed. And um, I wish you good luck on our final our, and all of our remaining issues as, as we wrap up our year. Take care and talk to you soon.